about the mechanism Ainsworth used to assess the secure base in infants. You're probably already familiar with the strange situation. So the strange situation is this research paradigm that Ainsworth carried out in her lab. And in the very first step, what would happen is the primary caregiver would arrive to the research lab with the infant. And the research lab is usually decorated to be sort of a neutral office space or more of an entertaining living room space. It's cozy. It's not too sterile or scary. So the caregiver and the infant enter the lab. And what we're looking for here is to see if the infant really clings tight to the caregiver or if they're okay wandering around the room. And so the infant's given some time and space to explore the toys to see what's happening. And we find some infants will go right away and explore the toys, some will after a bit of a time, and some will never, they'll hang tight to the caregiver. After they've been in the room for a couple moments, we go into step three. And step three is when a stranger will enter the research lab. Sometimes in some of these variations, the stranger would stay quiet, or maybe they would start off interacting with the parent, or maybe they would start off interacting with the infant. But regardless, what we're looking for in this stage is how the infant is reacting to the presence of the stranger. Are they having stranger anxiety? If this experiment is done around 12 months of age, they usually don't have any stranger anxiety, but they do exhibit a lot of social referencing. And what I mean by this is they'll look to their caregiver to see if their caregiver is smiling or neutral or fearful of the stranger. And they may follow the caregiver's lead by if the caregiver is friendly towards the stranger, they may also approach the stranger and follow their lead. We, some infants, of course, are going to go right up to the stranger and start interacting with them. Some are actually who were maybe in the middle of the room will go back to their parent. And some of them will have already been clinging to their parent or will run to their parent as soon as they see the stranger. But then after the stranger's been in the room for a few moments and the infant has calmed down and the stranger's not too new anymore, the parent will get up and leave. And this is what's called the first separation. So when the caregiver leaves and we look for the infant's response, some infants will become very upset right away. Some infants won't even notice, but we look to see what the infant's response will be. And then we get the stranger to try and soothe or interact with the infant. If the infant's upset, are they able to soothe them and calm them down? And if they're not upset, will the infant interact more with the stranger now that the parent has left? After the first separation, of course, we bring back in the parent. This is called the first reunion. And we look to see how the infant reacts to the parent coming back. If they were upset, do they calm down right away? If they were calm, do they seem happier? And if they were sort of indifferent to the parent being gone, do they even notice if the parent comes back? Now, what often goes completely unnoticed by the infant at this point, or minimally noticed, is while the parent is coming back, the stranger leaves. The infant doesn't really have an attachment to the stranger. They don't really usually respond to that, and we're less interested in that. But if the infant was upset, we let for the infant to become calm, and then once everything's sort of calm and back at baseline, we go through the second separation. And so in the second separation, this is now the parent gets up and leaves a second time. The stranger was already out of the room. This is when the infant is completely alone in the room. It's the only time in the experiment they're completely alone. And we can see them through a one-way mirror. We can see them with video cameras. They are safe, but we look to see their reaction. And perhaps they weren't upset when there was still one person in the room, but now they're upset now. Perhaps they were a little bit upset the first time and now they're much more upset, or maybe they're less upset, or maybe they're still indifferent, but we look to see their response to being left alone. This is usually the hardest part of the experiment to do because the parents tend to be very upset, especially if there's a strong protest cry at this point, the parents want to go back right in the room, especially if they're having a physiological reaction. And then we have stage seven, the stranger will enter first, not the parent, and they will attempt to comfort the infant. Even if the stranger successfully comfort them in the first separation, they often cannot comfort the infant this time around. And then we end it with the second reunion when the parent rejoins. And we look to see if this immediately calms the infant, if the infant needs a little bit more time to calm down, or if they really didn't even notice as things played out. And so the strange situation is a really complex research paradigm that can tell us a lot about which four types of attachment the infant likely has. And that's type A, type B, type C, or type D, according to Ainsworth terminology. So by type A, what Mary Ainsworth was referring to was an infant who had an insecure avoidant attachment. 
And what often he happened here in type A was an infant who didn't respond to the parent leaving and didn't really respond to the parent coming back, either the first or the second time. And what happens here is they're more interested in other elements of, of the room. They're more interested in the stranger, they're more interested in the toys, and they're not relying on the parent to be a secure base for them. This happens in about 20% of North American infants, and sometimes this just means the infant is independent. They have a good sense of autonomy, and they're okay with that. It might be a sign that there's other things going on there. It might be a sign that perhaps for some reason or another, they couldn't rely on their parent as a secure base. Perhaps their parents were sick. Perhaps they are not the primary caregiver in the infant's perspective. Perhaps the parent tends to ignore their emotional bids or doesn't tend to respond to them when they need them. So the infant has just sort of understood that they have to be more self-reliant. Or perhaps there's just an infant from the get-go who exhibited less eye contact and less connection with their parent. So type A might be the sign of something more problematic going on. Maybe the parent hasn't been sensitive and responsive. Or it might be the sign of a culture where infants tend to be more independent from a younger age. Or it might be the sign that the infant just has a really good sense of autonomy. But there's lots of different possibilities to explain what's happening in type A. As type A kids develop into childhood, they tend to be the ones that are just more independent, they're less clingy towards their friendship, and they like to be on their own. They might be the loners. This is very different from type B. So according to Ainsworth, type B was the classic secure base. This is the infant who's going to be upset when the parent leaves and they're gonna exhibit that protest cry, but as soon as the parent returns, they're quickly calmed and quickly soothed almost immediately as soon as they see the parents. That's the idea they anticipate that the parent is coming back to react and respond to their needs and they feel quite relieved about that. This is also sometimes called autonomous attachment and that's because the infant feels like their parent is the secure base as long as their parent's there things are good when their parent's not there things are not so good but while their parents are there they're free to do what they want and they're comfortable these infants might have been exploring the room until a stranger got there socially referenced checked out the parent and then when the parents left they might have said oh no oh no my parents are not here when they're here i know everything's going right when they're not here i don't know what's up and so about 65% of North American infants tend to fall into this category. It is marketed by distress with the absence of the parent, but lots of calm and comfort with reunion. And so it's just the idea they're looking to check in and support them. As these infants grow into childhood, they're the ones that are going to feel somewhat similar about the relationships. They tend to have the most positive social skills. They tend to develop the most positive coping strategies, and they really understand the nuances of friendship really well. So they do really good in school in terms of their teacher-child relationships and how they navigate other relationships with others because they really understand that relationships are about trusting each other. Now, although in infancy, they tend to cry when their parents leave, they do get over the crying bit by the time they're about age two, and they understand this internal working model about relationships and how they exist even when people are separated. So because of this, they're the type of person as they get older, they might call their parents and check in once in a while, but they're okay being independent. And they like friendships and relationships that are mutual and focused on mutual trust and reciprocity. Again, this is very different from type C. So Ainsworth really considered type C to be another type of insecure attachment. Type A was also insecure, insecure avoidant, but type C was often called lots of different names, sometimes called insecure resistant, insecure anxious, or insecure ambivalent. And as we get older, this is often called preoccupied. So type C is really describing someone who is very, very, very distressed when their loved ones leave. These infants in the strange situation get extremely upset when their caregivers leave, and they're also very angry and hostile when the caregiver returns. And the caregiver returns, they're not comforted right away like the securely attached. They become very aggressive, they might hit and claw at them, they hold a little bit of a grudge against them for a few moments. And so because of this little bit of angriness at the reunion, they are more likely to show this very jealous streak as they get older. What often happens is when they move into childhood, they're very overly clingy and overly dependent on their favorite people in life. So if they have one best friend, they might be very clingy to them and want to go everywhere they want. 
and want them to go everywhere they want to go, they might become very over attached to their teacher at school and become very jealous and possessive of the teacher when they spend more time on other kids, or they might become very jealous of their parent. They might be the child who's less likely to want to try and seek out autonomy and they're comfortable not trying to challenge themselves in that way. And as they get older into their adolescence, they're the ones that are really preoccupied with, are these people really my friends? Are they gossiping about me? And they're the people that really try and check in quite often and hover over you. So that's considered to be an insecure attachment because they're anxiously attached and they feel pretty insecure and they have trust issues. And then the fourth type of attachment, which was identified much later on than the first three, is what we call type D or disorganized attachment. It tends to only characterize about 5% of participants and it characterizes them because they don't follow one of the three other types. They sometimes pay attention or they sometimes don't, they're sometimes indifferent, they're sometimes hostile, they're sometimes a set but sometimes happy. They follow a mix of types A, B, and C. And so what happens here is they show really contradictory behavioral patterns. This might be because they were exposed to something traumatic or abusive. They might have a caregiver who yells and screams at them sometimes, or other times is really comforting. So they don't know whether they should avoid or approach that caregiver. Or they might be an infant who is just demonstrating atypical development. They may be an infant who doesn't really understand social relationships, perhaps because they're on the autism spectrum. Or they, may be, uh, or they may be an infant who, due to uh, realities outside of their caregiver's control, just received inconsistent care. Perhaps they had a caregiver who spent time in jail or who was hospitalized, and this inconsistent care really prevented them uh, from understanding the nuances of attachment. And so when these kids get older, they're going to have a hard time even understanding how friendships work, how to form friendship, and how to have regular social skills that other kids will display at the same age. So Ainsworth's work on attachment cannot be understated and cannot be underestimated. It's phenomenal work. But her work has been further addressed by the work of Mary Main, who looked at attachment in adolescence and beyond. And much like we find that type A, B, C, and D attachment really had repercussions beyond infancy, Mary Main also found that a secure attachment could predict things like better self-confidence, higher self-esteem, more leadership skills, and better academic grades. In addition, those infants who were securely attached tend to become the teenagers who are less likely to perform delinquent acts and likely to prolong their sexual activity until they're emotionally ready for that. And so adolescents, and so the secure base tends to be this really great protective factor for us in adolescence. And Maine's work has found this also has a transgenerational effect, that your infant attachment can not just play out in terms of your childhood and your adolescence, but it also impacts you into adulthood and then into the next generation if you become a parent yourself. So in terms of how this continues to roll along, not only does the relationship and attachment you have with your primary caregiver influence your friendships and the type of attachment you'll have with other family members and with your teachers, but it will also impact the type of attachment you have with your romantic relationships. That is an individual who has an insecure avoidant attachment when they're an infant and they tend to be more of a loner when they're a kid they tend to go on to display commitment issues when they think about romantic relationships. They've been so used to being indifferent to others and only trusting themselves and wearing and protecting themselves that when it comes to relationships, they don't want to become vulnerable. In fact, they don't trust people. If they're in a romantic relationship and their partner says, I have to go away for a month for this study abroad program, is that okay? they may decide just to break up with them right then and there because they don't believe that the relationship could sustain that separation. In comparison, the insecure anxious or insecure resistant or insecure ambivalent attachment may grow up into someone who's extra clingy and extra jealous. So much so that in a romantic relationship, if their partner had to go overseas for a month, they may say, okay, okay, you have to call me every night and you have to bring me all the best souvenirs. But then when they call and they're FaceTiming at night, they cry and they guilt them and they shame them for going away. I can't believe you left me. I can't believe you made me do this. I'm here all alone. You should feel terrible for leaving me. And so they've really become very possessive and controlling. In comparison, the infants that were more securely attached 
are more likely to develop romantic relationships built on mutual trust and reciprocity. And although they're going to miss their significant other when they go away for a month overseas, and it does hurt and they do miss them, they're happy for them. And if they do FaceTime them once in a while while they're overseas, they don't spend the time on FaceTime crying or sulking about it. They spend the time happy to see their loved one and cheering them on and wanting to hear about the stories. And when they return, they meet them with a big hug and they're just fulfilled and they don't guilt them out over being away. And so we can really see these three main types of attachment play out in all different types of relationships throughout the lifespan. And of course, this continues if we become parents ourselves. So those who were securely attached tend to go on to provide a really sensitive type of caregiving. And that is if you were a securely attached infant and now you are a parent yourself, you tend to want to support the autonomy of your kids. And especially when they move out of the home, you know, you might call in once in a while and uh, check in on them, but you want to give them the right level of autonomy. You're sensitive, you're, you're aware of their emotional climate, if they want you, if they don't want you around, and you try to respond accordingly. If you were an infant who was more insecurely avoid and attached with those commitment issues, what often happens is when you become a parent yourself, you tend to be a more dismissive parent. And this is the idea, you, your relationship with your parent was so strained and it wasn't close. You tend to idealize that and say, oh, that was normal. I never talked to my dad, but that was normal. And so as a parent, you say, I don't need to talk to my kids about this. I come home from work, I'll do my thing, they do their thing, that's how it works and you become strangers in your own house. So you distance yourself from your own kids. Now for those individuals who were the insecure, anxious, resistant, ambivalent, they become so jealous and possessive that really plays out in their role as a parent. They become the really preoccupied adults where they don't supply their child with autonomy support. They really hover or helicopter around their kids. They are very intrusive and very over controlling of their kids. So this is the idea, they're checking their jeans pockets even when they're 20 year old and they find a lighter or something, or they're wanting to read their diary, or they're wanting to put tracking devices on their phones. And it's the idea that they are really preoccupied with it. And when the kid moves away from home, they wanna call the time and come over, and they're very emotionally invested in the relationship in a perhaps toxic way, to the point that they don't understand that the best thing about raising a kid is so they can fly away from home. They want to smother and to continue to protect them. And finally, if we do have someone who had that 5% disorganized attachment as an infant, that's showing they really don't understand how relationships work. And when they become an adult, they may have really unresolved attachments about this. Perhaps their parent died when they were young. Perhaps they moved away. Perhaps they experienced war or really significant trauma. But what happens is these individuals tend to have a high level of fear and disorientation around being a parent. Perhaps their parents get divorced and they never got to see one of their parents and they say, I don't know how to do this. You know, I let my dad walked out when I was five. I don't know how to be a parent myself. I don't want to be like them. And so they acknowledge that they have this conflict, but it really stifles them from trying to parent and trying to do it in a coherent way. The good news about this is once you understand what's going on with your attachment, we can change it. And changing your attachment can happen if you have a secure relationship with someone else in your life. For instance, let's say your attachment with your primary caregiver was not so great. If you form a secure attachment later on life with a friend, with a teacher, with a romantic partner, or with your own kids, having that secure relationship can help you to flip your attachment style. It can be done. We also know attachment can flip the other way. You can start off with a really secure attachment, but then if your parents get divorced or if a parent dies, or if in your romantic relationship somebody cheats on you, you can go from having a secure attachment to an insecure attachment. So these can change over the lifespan, but they tend to only change when there's really major stuff going on. That being said, this was the foundations of our emotional development, and I hope you've enjoyed them. You've now reached the end of Unit 4.